Okay, good morning again. I think two minutes before we start, we can just spend a few words to thank you again for being here, for, take part, for taking part uh, at uh, 84 parallel session of the Marcel Grossman meeting. So today we have three talks during this morning, I mean Italian time at least. After a short break, we have uh, just two talks because one of the speakers is no longer available for uh, for his talk. So we can immediately ask Alessio if uh, he's able to share his presentation. Yeah, good morning. We don't hear you. You have to switch on your microphone. Okay. Good morning, everybody, again. Good morning. Now we see and hear you perfectly. Okay, so... Can you also see my screen now? Perfectly. Um, as usual, I have to say, well, uh, we have just 15 minutes each, but obviously if you need um, some extra minutes, it's not a bad, a so bad deal because in general, uh, speakers so far have... Uh, acquired more minutes for their presentations. So generally speaking, at least. So in case you're able to stay in within 15 minutes, it, it would be great. Otherwise it's fine just to have 20 minutes, not more because otherwise um, we will have some issues with the other speakers. And this is valid for everybody of us, for even for me that I am the second speaker today, <laughs> it, it, it will be, difficult i know perfectly so let's try so and you have 15 minutes from now please alessio you can start okay, thank, you. thank you so my talk is about uh, entanglement characterization uh, within a modified the theory of gravity that is the einstein cartan theory that i will briefly recall uh, in a while and i studied the entanglement for uh, fermionic and bosonic fields in particular for the dirac field and for klein gordon field so the scalar field Starting from the einstein cartan theory, um, as I said, this is a modified theory of gravity in which the novelty is the presence of spin as a dynamical concept. And in particular, spin is related to a geometric, geometric quantity that is uh, torsion. So in addition to curvature of space time, we also have torsion. Now I will uh, give a, a precise definition of a mathematical definition of torsion. But uh, I want to say that the effects of spin, so the effects, of the, the difference between uh, the Einstein capacity and the general relativity uh, is uh, significant only at very high mass densities that are much higher than, for example, atomic densities, but are still much smaller than the Planck density in which uh, uh, the quantum effects of gravity uh, dominate. So we, we need a quantum theory of gravity. So the idea is that uh, the einstein cartan theory is a classical theory, but uh, if in the future we will have a, a quantum theory of gravity, the einstein cartan theory may prove to be a better classical limit of this theory with respect to general relativity. Uh, one is a slide about motivation. Why do we need to introduce uh, uh, torsion so to, to introduce spin as a dynamical concept? The idea is that in, in this way, we can obtain the correct generalization of uh, the conservation law for total angular momentum uh, in presence of gravity. And um, other reasons are, for example, that if we consider uh, metric and torsion as uh, independent quantities, we can restore the role of Poincare group that is fundamental in particle physics, but is not present in general relativity. And uh, another important reason is that, uh, as I will show, torsion could be in principle also a dark matter candidate as I will briefly describe for both uh, And this slide is to summarize what I've said. In the presence, uh, as you can see, the presence of torsion and spin can close this circle and so restore the role of, the role of Poincare group within uh, gravity. In giving some mathematical definitions, uh, as I've said, the einstein cartan theory uh, starts from uh, two basic assumptions. The first one is different from general relativity, and it is that the affine connections are no longer symmetric, as you can see. And from we will see the definition of torsion. While the second assumption is the same, is uh, present also in general relativity, and is that the covariant derivative of the metric tensor is, uh, is zero. 
And the space time in which uh, this theory works is typically called uh, Riemann Cartan or also U4 space time. Uh, from the fact that torsion is no uh, the affine connection is no longer symmetric, we can define torsion in this way as the anti-symmetric part of the affine connection. And accordingly, we can uh, write the total affine connection as the uh, levi civita connection of general relativity plus a contribution related to torsion that is called contortion tensor. And as you can see, it's related by this formula to, to torsion. Now we move to the entanglement characterization in, uh, in such a theory. Uh, we start from a friedman robertson worker space time in which uh, we introduce conformal time. So the metric can be written in this way. And we have to consider that uh, we assume an expanding universe with scale, scale factor of, uh, of this form typically. It, it has three parameters, as you can see, A and B describe the total volume of the universe uh, during expansion, while rho describe the rapidity of the, uh, the expansion. And this is a plot of, uh, of the, our scale factor. Uh, in, in such a framework, uh, a torsion, the most general form for uh, the torsion tension is this one, in which we have uh, two external functions that are F and H. And the only non-zero contribution to the torsion tensor are uh, this one. And accordingly, one can uh, derive, of course, the, contri the non-zero contribution for the contortion that are written here. And at the moment, uh, F and H are external function. So we, we will uh, consider some particular cases uh, in, uh, in future slides. Okay, so starting from the, the Dirac field, the Dirac equation in uh, uh, Riemann-Cartan space-time has this general form, the first one, uh, where we have introduced the curved gamma matrices, and this is the torsionless spin connection that is present, of course, since it's torsionless also in general relativity, because only this last term is uh, related to the presence of torsion in, in space-time. And uh, if now we impose the cosmological principle so we use the previous answers for torsion. We can write the Dirac equation in, uh, in this way. This equation admits analytical solution only in the asymptotic regions. And uh, this can be written in this way, uh, where uh, uh, n is a normalization factor, while w is uh, the, the, the spinner, the, the four component spinner. And uh, starting from this solution, we can write so the Dirac field operator in both regions, first question is for the in region, while the second one is for the out region. And uh, in order to study particle production and so to derive entanglement, one should uh, find the Bogoliubov transformation that relates the in solutions to the out solutions. But since, as I've said, uh, we cannot obtain an analytical solution to the Dirac equation in presence of torsion. Uh, for during all the expansion of space time, since we have solutions only in the asymptotic regions, call for approximate solutions. We can assume that uh, since this is physically motivated, that torsion is negligible during the expansion of the universe. And in this way, it's possible to write uh, Bogoliubov transformation for creation and destruction operator for particle and antiparticles. Uh, we can also derive the number of particle and antiparticle created uh, by the expansion of the universe in, in, uh, in a Riemann Cartan space time that are uh, written in this way, where uh, beta is uh, this coefficient here in the Bogoliubov transformation between the out and the in regions. And starting from particle creation uh, in, in the common way that is done also in general relativity, one can study entanglement. The first step is to write the density, the particle antiparticle density operator. So one starts from the vacuum state in the in region and write this state as function of out states. And uh, it has this complete expression, as you can see. Uh, and this state is pure, so this state has no entropy. But if we consider we, we, we take a partial trace of uh, this density operator, we can trace uh, over particles or antiparticles. Here is done over antiparticle, but it is the same. One can write uh, so the, the reduced density operator corresponding to particle or antiparticle, as I've said, it's the same. And accordingly, write, write the von Neumann entropy that has uh, this general expression 
here we have also assumed that uh, the number of particle and antiparticle created with both spin up and down is the same. That's why we have a general N and no longer NA and P as in, in the previous slide. And this is the, so what happens when a torsion is accounted uh, in static entanglement. The blue plot is a plot without torsion because the function that gives torsion is zero. While the other plots are related to torsion, so that is a, we took a certain value for uh, the torsion parameter and uh, we essentially see, see, what happens, see what happened. And uh, as you can see, the larger is torsion, so the larger is the parameter that describes torsion, the larger entanglement we have. And also, as, as you can see, uh, entanglement is um, drastically modified for uh, small values of the momentum. And here are the parameters that we have used. Um, this plot is, uh, should be compared to the, its general relativistic counterpart, but this is to show that if we increase the mass of our particles, the effects of torsion become smaller. Because in the torsion S case, uh, here there is a, a light blue line, and this is not present. But essentially, this means that increasing the mass, the effects of torsion becomes smaller. We want to show this with this plot. Moving to the Klein-Gordon field, of course, in this case, since torsion is really related to spin, we do not have a minimal coupling of torsion to spin, but we also have a minimal coupling scheme that can be described by this last term in the Klein-Gordon equation. So torsion can be decomposed in five terms. The first one is not related to torsion, it's related to the uh, Ricci curvature, but the terms from two to five are related uh, explicitly to torsion. And um, while these parameters are for the moment arbitrary, this, equations, this equation can be studied in, uh, in different ways. Uh, here I show you what happens if we consider a completely anti-symmetric torsion. So in this case, the only relevant contribution to this equation is the term P4 that can be written in this way. And it, uh, as I've said, describe completely anti-symmetric torsion. And accordingly, the, the Klein-Gordon equation can be written in, uh, in this way. We are assumed for, for what concerned the, the first term, that is the, the scalar curvature, we are assumed conformal coupling. And uh, in this way, this, this study is similar to the Dirac case because the torsion is described only by the parameter f, so the function f, and the parameter f is zero, as, uh, as you will see. And accordingly, uh, in this case, uh, in order, while for the Dirac case, we cannot obtain analytic solution in, in, in any way. In this case, for special answers for the torsion function, we can derive analytic solution. For example, this is uh, one case. And for example, this can be the case of some uh, uh, inflationary scenarios, for example, in which we have expansion since you, as I've said, A is uh, the scale factor. And um, the procedure is the same for the, for, as in the Dirac case. So one has to write the Klein-Gordon field operator in, uh, in and out regions and look for the Bogolub of transformation that uh, has this form in this case. Here, this is the field of the, the Klein-Gordon field. And uh, accordingly, one have to, to start to, to rewrite the density operator corresponding to, to the total state. Then take the trace again. We have traced over antiparticles. Here, this is given by this minus k. And from here, I can write the, the form and entropy that for the Klein Gordon case has uh, this form, where the parameter alpha is, is related to the coefficients of the Bogolub of transformations. And uh, this is what happens for, uh, for the Klein Gordon uh, field when one accounts uh, the presence of torsion. This plot. Uh, is uh, related to different parameters, coupling parameters of torsion to the field, because uh, as I've said, this is the, the coupling parameter that in principle is arbitrary, we, we, we took these values. And uh, the other plot in that shows uh, how the entanglement is modified if we consider different values for, for the torsion parameter. Uh, and, and okay, just some, I, I think, uh, I mean, the, conclusions about my work. So uh, we have seen that the presence of torsion in general affect entanglement, so it, it, it modifies entanglement. While for the Dirac field, 
uh, we have in particular for small values of the, of the momentum uh, drastical changes in, in entanglement due, due to torsion. For the Klein-Gordon field, uh, entanglement is slightly modified. It, this, is, this happens also because uh, while in the Dirac case, uh, we have a, a minimal coupling of uh, torsion to the field. Of course, in the Klein-Gordon case, since uh, Klein-Gordon field is spinless, we do not have a minimal coupling procedure, so we have also no minimal coupling. In this case, in the end, torsion slightly modifies entanglement in principle, and, and we also need uh, larger values for torsion in order to see these effects. Another con important conclusion that we have uh, done is that in principle, we have considered a bosonic torsion also for the, the Dirac case, because we took torsion as an external function. Uh, so spin is not taken into account when we write torsion in that way. So in principle, there should be a more refined treatment in which one uh, include the spin in, uh, in the answers for torsion, and one should see what happens in principle. We expect that um, there should not no longer be such a, a drastic modification of torsion for small values of, uh, of the momentum if we take into account spin within uh, the torsion answers. And in general, we should also consider a more realistic model of, of expansion for the universe because uh, we have used uh, uh, the, the usual toy model in which one considers a smooth expansion of the universe and uh, two asymptotic phases that are needed in order to define properly particles. But in principle, one, sh one may also consider different models for the expansion of the universe and, and one should see what happens. And uh, as I've said at the beginning, uh, in, in principle, we can also relate the presence of torsion to, to dark matter. For the Dirac field, this can be done assuming that the uh, particles due to torsion, uh, in particular particle uh, for small values of the momentum, because we have seen in that case we have a, a larger entanglement that is related to a larger particle production, can be related to torsion, and this, this is what we have tried to do. While for the Klein-Gordon field, uh, somebody has proposed that torsion uh, can be responsible, can be essentially can be related to dark matter uh, by means uh, of, of uh, an X during which the east field can give mass to torsion, and but also this approach should be studied further in, in more detail. So to conclude, our results are summarized in, uh, in this paper. And as I said, in principle, there is much work to do, in particular to relate to torsion to dark matter, both for the fermionic fields of the Dirac field and the Klein-Gordon field. And uh, that's all I got to to have done in time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, so thank you for your nice talk. Uh, any questions to Alessio? Orlando, can I make a question to Alessio? Sure. Alessio, uh, you said before that the higher is the mass, the, le the more negligible is the curvature. Uh, the sorry, the contribution of the yes. torsion is that something uh, expected in some way? Is that something related to some physical interpretation, as far as you know? Well, I think so because uh, when we have studied the, the the Dirac equation with torsion, we have assumed that torsion is small with respect to the energy without torsion. So yes, in principle, this is expected because it's related to this fact, because if we increase the mass, we also increase the energy uh, without torsion. And so the contribution of torsion to the total energy is smaller. And so according to our procedure, that is, as I've said, something approximate, it's not analytical, it's, it's an approximation. We expect that increasing the mass, we increase the energy and uh, so the effect of torsion are, are uh, smaller and that's why torsion becomes negligible, uh, increasing the mass. So yes, it's expected we, within our model is expected. Uh, even if, as I've said, this is an approximate uh, model for the Dirac field, but yes, it's expected within our, uh, our model. Okay, thank you, very clear, thank you. Roberto, were you aware of actually because a similar question has been raised by, by the referee? 
Okay. Well, I'm not, the, I'm not the referee, as a matter of fact, but looks like it's a very uh, natural question, probably. Yeah, no, just kidding. <laughs> Obviously. Any more questions to Alessio? I have one. Please. Uh, do you plan to use other uh, entangle entanglement entropy measures or the one that you use is the only one possible? I think that there, there are others. For example, uh, in some papers, I found somebody uh, has used, uh, for example, the negativity. But uh, within this model, I think this is the 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 best, or at least the, the simplest one to use. But yes, there are other uh, other way to to quantify entanglement. As I've said, this is the, the negativity that, for example, is 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 used very frequently when one study entanglement harvesting, that is a procedure that is related to entanglement characterization in, uh, in relativistic scenarios. But mm, I think that this is the simplest one for, for our approach in which we consider uh, toy models for the expansion of the universe and write the corresponding state. But there are others and yes, in principle, uh, we can try to use other measures for entanglement. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, if not, we. I want to acknowledge again Alessio for his nice talk. Now, unfortunately, I have to present myself because the other organizer is no longer able, and so I'm the only one to present myself. Sorry for that. So I'm the second one. Um, I'm trying now to share my screen. Okay, do you see something? I hope so. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you for your feedback. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you something about this paper, this work based on some efforts that I'm going to, to work with uh, Roberto Jambo present here in the uh, in the list of, of people who enjoyed this conference today. Um, and based on, also on some papers that we are working with uh, other colleagues in the University of Camerino, especially. Okay, so the, the, um, the way in which I split my presentation is to start with revising the cosmological constant problem, then we pass to the dynamics of uh, a particular fluid that is able to solve this problem, to heal the, the problem, the cosmological constant problem, I mean. And so the, the, the fluid that I, I quoted is matter with pressure. Typically you see that you know that dust is the uh, prominent fluid using cosmology together with radiation, neutrinos, and so forth. But in this case, we assume a different approach to explain the matter behavior. Then we work out early time uh, phase uh, transition based on uh, small perturbations. Then we uh, try to face how to solve the vacuum, uh, the, the vacuum energy problem related to the cosmological constant problem. And I will explain to you some details, obviously very briefly because I have just 15 minutes as usual. So you know perfectly that if you want to puzzle standard cosmology, you have to start with some free marble of worker standard metric that is based on homogeneity and isotropy of the universe. Our approach consists in taking into account this met metric, but considering it only for particular phases of the universe evolution and imagining to get just one phase at least in which you have geometrical production of something. That something is interpreted in terms of dark matter and dark matter having a non-vanishing pressure term that is able to, will be able, would be able, let's cross the fingers to solve the cosmological constant problem, the moving, the um, degrees of freedom coming from quantum field theory predictions, because you know that the cosmological constant problem is something related to the, um, the very large magnitude that you get when you infer from quantum field theory, uh, the vacuum energy. The vacuum, uh, the vacuum energy in terms of the constant energy that enter, enters the energy momentum tends to Einstein equations. So we assume that phase A, phase B, phase C, phase C um, 
are just a, a, a good ex a good example to describe the universe, indicating with phase A the uh, the initial part of the the universe evolution, phase C our time starting from CMB for example, so from early times, and phase B due to some over densities, not exactly uh, something that is homogeneous and isotropic, but something that works like um, a universe more complicated somehow. I will explain it in detail why. So uh, our idea is to take into account the Friedman equations written in terms of just one fluid, but restoring the existence of the Bayer cosmological constant that is interpreted in terms of the pressure and additional density entering the uh, the matter contribution. In such a way, you should uh, you can mime the, this fluid using just one fluid approach that takes into account only uh, matter but having pressure. You know that in standard thermodynamics. Uh, any fluid has uh, its own pressure. So it, there is no reason a priori to uh, dismiss this hypothesis. And so we believe that, for example, dark matter, the fluid that can be created during this quick phase, the phase B that I quoted before, could be, could be responsible for um, cancelling out the degrees of freedom coming from uh, vacuum energy. So in this respect, we can we will be able to solve the fine tuning and coincidence problems that are uh, byproducts of the standard uh, cosmological constant problem. I will explain why in the next slides. Uh, by the way, uh, obviously, if you uh, delete the quantum field theory predictions of vacuum energy, then you uh, absolutely solve the fine tuning issues issue and as well as coincidence that the, that is solved why because you take into account just a matter fluid so the cor uh, cor corresponding uh, pressure induced by this matter fluid should be of the same order of magnitude with respect to the density of the fluid itself and so this absolutely solves the uh, coincidence issue because the coincidence does not exist anymore so to understand this let us focus on phase b and phase b here you have the standard, cosm um, um, the standard cosm cosmological constant problem where you measure uh, the, the, the vacuum energy plus the bare cosmological constant that is just an integration constant that enters the, 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 the Einstein equations. So the sum is what you measured and um, what you measured in, in the recent past is absolutely far from predictions. So in principle, you are not able to solve this problem by hand because it is not possible to delete uh, the, the vacuum energy contribution because if you cancel it, if you see the figure, if you cancel it at the very beginning, then you get it at the final state of your problem. But if you do the opposite, so if you delete at the final state, you get at the very beginning the same energy contribution due to this offset V node that you, that you can see from the standard a potential of quantum field theory for spontaneous breaking symmetry that everybody of you knows. So the idea is to take into account the phase B in which you have uh, a different behavior with respect to the Freeman robertson workers. Uh, and so in this respect, you get some hints toward the production of particles here, not only uh, standard particles, so not only biogenesis. In fact, uh, in a recent uh, development that we are uh, working on, and that has been described in, on Monday by, by Marc Antonini, we, this, we show that it is possible to infer um, baryons during this phase if you couple uh, with the evolution of the universe, in this case with the variation of inflaton, a, a baryonic current. In our case, we believe that in order to get particle production in, term of, in terms of uh, dark matter pairs, you should so in terms of equation five that is very very well known in the literature um this geometrical production could be induced if you consider the uh, the quantum current for baryons that depends upon uh, some curvature parameter for example ricci and in this case in, in the wild the wild tensor so uh, in this example uh, i report the the possibility that to, to have just two epochs uh, for, give you, uh, for giving you a, an heuristic example, if you have two epochs that are Friedman Robertson worker, if you want that the universe works like a smooth uh, dynamical system, you should have uh, the combination of these two uh, epochs uh, themselves. And so you should require the Israel Darmois junct uh, junction equations. And in this respect, you evaluate the fundamental sigma forms and you get the conditions 
uh, for matching at least two epochs. In order to have the intermediate one that I quoted before, you should take these conditions and forget about it. So you should take conditions like that, imagining a phase transition for this metastable phase um, in which you get particles from a particular transition that in this case is interpreted in terms of geometrical quantities. So what happens now uh, at the end of this process? You know that now we produce particles and that's okay. And you interpret these particles in terms of dark matter. That's um, quite obvious for us because we, we should have uh, dark matter production in the universe. But afterwards, what happened? We believe the Lagrangian to be composed now uh, in the phase C, I mean, by two contributions. Um, the first one is composed by uh, a kinetic part and a Lagrangian multiplier that uh, implies the, the sum of all, the, all, all kinds of energies entering your problem. So, for example, chemical energy, potentials, and so forth. The second part is the, due to the standard potential of symmetry breaking. If you want that this matter can acquire some kind, some kind of, uh, of pressure after the process itself. So the, the Lagrangian, the first part of the Lagrangian that I called uh, lambda uh, L1, sorry, uh, is composed by uh, baryons and dark matter because dark matter uh, has a time to form. And afterwards, you should impose that the potential is under the form of a particular spontaneous breaking potential. Um, and in this case, in particular, we uh, chose exactly the, 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 the most standard one. So the one that I, uh, I quoted when I showed you the figure uh, for that, I, I told you that it is impossible to remove the cosmological constant problem by hand. So you get, obviously, uh, a transition time, so a transition ten temperature, uh, with respect to which you have that the um, equilibrium is, is no longer reached before the transition, and it is reached after the transition, if you, uh, as you can see from equation 12. So uh, the only assumption that we make here is to assume the, um, the cosmological principle, and this means that you have um, a shift symmetry over the field phi. The symmetry means that you have uh, a scalar uh, for which you can add or, um, or you can uh, yeah, yeah, we can. You can add this this color to the field itself, and then the field uh, uh, continues being the same, and the universe as well. So the description is absolutely equivalent in whichever direction you see, uh, um, in agreement with the cosmological principle. And in quantum, in in this quantum picture, this is accounted by uh, Stuckelberg fields that are absolutely the fields uh, that work like um, the one that you see uh, thanks to the ship symmetry. Then you evaluate some thermodynamical um, properties of the model. And if you require that the, um, the, the, the standard energy, uh, the, Helmholtz, the Helmholtz energy is positive, as well as for any kinds of thermodynamic processes that we see in laboratory, then the pressure becomes negative by construction. So the Lagrangian is very easy. And the pressure now is negative, not by hand, but by construction. What is not exactly um, matchable with the existence of a Bayer cosmological constant that I quoted before, uh, and in order also to remove the degrees of freedom coming from uh, lambda vacuum energy contribution, is that this pressure is not a constant quantity, it's not a constant quantity. In order to understand if the pressure can be constant, let us see what happens to the symmetries of the problem. So let us investigate the native, the native theorem that works for any kinds of Lagrangian that shows uh, that show a particular symmetry uh, of the system. We have to uh, conserve the current here that uh, can be summed together in order to give the, the total entropy of your problem, of your system. You see that the, um, the Lagrangian is, um, implies a, a conserved quantity and conserved number of particles if it is independent from uh, the, the, the field phi. This, is, this has as immediate consequence that the Lagrangian depends upon x only. And this is a great consequence for us because you get, as I told you, um, that the number of particles is conserved, but you, you also get the pressure should be uh, a constant. Sorry if I uh, try to rush, but unfortunately the time is not so much. So in order to understand if this requirement is correct, it's fine for our purposes, 
that does investigate the properties of the fluid from small perturbations. So if you insert all the properties of this fluid, so if you take into account the mm, no productions of particles, if you take into account the fact that Lagrangian does not depend upon phi, uh, and if you take into account that Lagrangian has to conserve the currents into the scheme of small perturbations, then you immediately get that the sound speed should be zero, should vanish, it should vanish. And as a consequence of this recipe, you get that the pressure should be a constant. This happens when the um, Lagrange multiplier, um, its variation, sorry, is different from zero. And it, that's quite obvious because during a phase transition, you cannot require that this quantity y is, uh, is zero, otherwise the transition itself does not occur. So you get as a consequence of byproduct of this, you get that the Gibbs energy in proximity of uh, um, each minima um, should be zero as well as the temperature that should be constant. But the most important thing is that you get a constant pressure different from the cosmological constant. In this case, in fact, you have a constant pressure, but you don't have a constant density. This happens when you have a mm, non-constant uh, varying equation of state, obviously. So uh, what about now uh, quantum vacuum energy? Because I told you we require that the universe is accelerated, uh, behaves using this model, but you also require that the, the, the model should, uh, should delete the degrees of freedom of uh, the cosmological constant coming from quantum field theory. So the, the way is this, to solve the problem, the cosmological constant problem, and to restore the factor the, the lambda CDM model that is saved in this approach. If you take um, the, the vacuum energy, you have two possibilities. The ones that I told you before when I explained the existence of the figure and the behavior of the, um, of the potential that I, um, I prompted to you before. You, the, the first case is that before the transition, you have an effective potential that is zero, and this corresponds to V node equal to minus K phi node of, uh, to four over four. This is accounted in this uh, description where you have pressure and density before the transition and after the transition. So in order to have um, uh, F larger than zero, and I recall you, F is the energy, the thermodynamic energy, the Helmholtz energy of your system, you have that the density uh, changes accordingly to the equation 23 that you see in this slide. But the other case is also possible. So V naught equal to zero, and after the transition, you have that the effective potential should be zero. But in this case, you have different orders of magnitude, which is the correct uh, route to follow. The correct route to follow is to notice that the second case, V naught equal to zero, is exactly the lambda CDM model that we are working with today. So the model that suffers from the two uh, caveats that you know. So coincidence and uh, fine tuning, why? Because the magnitude that you have for K is too large with respect to the magnitude of uh, rho dm and rho bm that you uh, see in front of one plus Z to three. Um, and so this model um, is, is possible only if you admit a discontinuity of the effective potential in this form with these orders of magnitudes, absolutely the uh, issue that we face today. In this respect, then we, uh, you get immediately the, the lambda CDM model, but you get also a solution for it. Because if you take into account the question 29, in which you made the assumption that the velocity, the, the, well, the, 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 let me say that the, the pressure of dark matter is larger than the pressure of baryons, then you get equation uh, 31, in which you have exactly the same form of the lambda CDM model as well as the one that you can see here, but with different orders of magnitude because now the universe behave after the, behaves after the transition using minus KBM uh, that corresponds to a, a pressure related to baryons that before, uh, after the transition obviously, um, and all the degrees of freedom, the excess of lambda has been delayed, um, has been deleted by this process using a, a symmetry breaking that is induced by quantum, uh, by our quantum recipe. So nothing put by hand, nothing considered a priori, nothing assumed 
just using the standard process that, that underlines the X mechanism that you know perfectly, that is broadcast here uh, in, the, in the picture of standard cosmology. Assuming that dark matter has been formed before in the geometric phase that I told you before. So a few consequences that I uh, already told you is that the mechanism elites, the vacuum energy cosmology contribution to the use of dark matter, because dark matter is responsible for this um, translation. And all the quantities, for example, the coupling constants and all the strengths entering the, the picture itself uh, are well fixed by the theory itself. So are not unknown, are not um, exotic quantities to be fixed somehow and uh, in tension with other things and so forth. So the only thing that is missing in this picture is how to form variance. And I told you um, in the incoming paper in the, in the next few days, you will see on archive the second part of this work that for brevity is not reported here um, because I have not enough time to explain you also that part. Uh, but you get an emergent cosmological constant by only using the pressure of, um, of standard matter. So um, let us take into account the hypothesis of dust and let us expand this hypothesis. That, that, that let us go further. This hypothesis assuming an emergent cosmological constant uh, that is equivalent to the bare cosmological constant. That's why at the very beginning I told you that we are trying to mime the fluid entering the, the, the Einstein picture, the, the Einstein equations, I mean, um, with just one fluid of matter with the property of uh, deleting um, the degrees of free moment of the cosmological constant. Well, obviously we require dark matter, but that's obvious. Uh, dark matter exists as you as you know. So um, the goal of our approach is to evaluate also the candidate for dark matter. So let us take into account the thermal universe in the standard picture that we have with the only recipe you know. that we could underline that is exactly the recipe uh, that we that I explained to you before. So, cause some pressure. Uh, the Hubble rate that evolves in terms of the quantities that en that enter the Lagrangian and so on. So, let us take into account the standard uh, puzzle of um, uh, thermal universe. Let us take into account the out process. Let us take into account the standard observations that Planck uh, furnished us uh, recently. And so, let us put all together with some particular values for gamma that is related to the cross-section in a standard annihilation of dark matter candidate. Uh, well, this is a very, very common uh, scheme for evaluating the, the mass or the properties of dark matter candidates. So using the Boltzmann equation uh, uh, as usual, I want to, I want to stress, um, just for having uh, intervals of values, we are able to get the minimal values uh, the, 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 the lower uh, bound for dark matter for a dark matter candidate that is able to to solve this puzzle and it lies in the more, more or less around the interval 0 0.5 1.7 TeV it's not the only the unique um, range of values possible because you can have also other ranges uh, but um, not smaller than this one what I wanted to to um, to stress it is that we cannot have axions, for example. So we are predicting something very different from axions that, is, that are mo mostly common in the literature um, so far because, uh, well, as dark matter candidates seem to be uh, uh, suitable somehow and people are looking for them. So concluding, Mm, the approach is able to um, imagine how dark matter is produced during the during phase B. So how geometrically you can get dark matter. So dark matter can solve the problem of uh, the, the cosmological constant problem if uh, it uh, acquires acquires a, a pressure um, from standard considerations of thermodynamics. You can get uh, immediately the sign of the pressure itself in order to understand if the pressure is constant or or is a function of something, you should admit uh, small perturbations. Immediately you find that the pressure is constant. You can mime uh, the fluid that you have using uh, matter with pressure uh, instead of considering the bare cosmological contribution. And you can delete off the, um, the, quantum, uh, the quantum vacuum energy using the process that I told you and um, essentially the standard symmetry breaking. Then you get from thermal considerations uh, you get immediately 
the, the, the interval of value for, for, for the mass of, of dark matter candidates able to frame out the universe in this respect. So thank you very much. Any questions I have to say by myself? Uh, I would have a question. Yeah, please. So if I understand correctly, you only have, uh, let's say, a matter fluid, which acts both as matter and uh, cosmological constant, right? And for doing this, you introduce pressure in the matter component. Well, not exactly. You, okay. are, appro you, are, approximating, you are approximating matter with pressure assuming that the extra contribution comes from the Bayer cosmological constant. Okay, yes. Yeah. That you, in principle, you have the Bayer cosmological constant as an integration uh, constant, which is it, its physical meaning. The physical uh, meaning is related to one fluid only that is honestly based on, uh, on matter, just matter, that, mm -hmm. that, that's all. So it's a, a kind of interpretation that happens after a phase B, because I told you- All right. Okay, in, during phase B, you get particles, you get dark matter particles, they uh, should have pressure. So how you, do you interpret this, uh, the, this, the, this extra term in such a way? Okay, so this That's will lead that. to my question. There is okay. also this model, uh, the generalized dark matter model, where you have a fluid, which is, let's call it dark matter, which has pressure and sound speed and then you still have the standard cosmological constant. Uh, if I want to, I don't know, compare your model with uh, this model, how could I, where, how and where would I see differences? I don't know, in the background or in perturbations, and if it's in perturbations eventually, where and why? Uh, absolutely in perturbations first, because you, mm -hmm. you have to take into account that the pressure is constant. So the sound speed that you quoted should be zero, should vanish otherwise, you cannot be the, the, the same model that I got. Um, and in, in, in your case, you have the, the cosmological constant contribution because you did not take into account uh, a, a way to uh, delete, to cancel the, the, the extra contribution coming from quantum field lambda. I mean, so, uh, well, the, the cosmological constant problem is the last problem to understand if the cosmological model, the, the standard cosmological model works well or not. So if you are able to cancel out this term, so the, the lambda term, you are able to save the lambda CDM model and to, and to state definitively that the model works properly well. So um, the point is that in, in, your, in the models that you quoted, you still have the cosmological constant because you have no mechanism from a quantum viewpoint, obviously, that are able to cancel out the contributions of quantum vacuum, en vacuum energy. And so you still have the bare cosmological constant and you can interpret your pressure, the pressure that enters these models uh, in terms of the, um, the bare cosmological constant, but you have to put by hand because um, it is not possible without a quantum perspective, you know. So the, the advantage of using my approach is to consider um, a quantum, a quantum uh, mechanism able to elite the cosmological constant contribution coming from quantum field theory. In your case, you should work in perturbations. You should take into account a constant pressure, a zero uh, sound speed, adiabatic one, I mean. Um, and then you, you have to impose the, um, uh, the Hubble parameter with the same uh, with the same recipe that I used for uh, uh, for, for for the presentation. So that's the changes that you have to do. Nothing special. Ah, and the equation of state, uh, obviously, because the equation of state is not exactly minus one in this case. It's an evolving factor that evolves uh, with respect to the density, and so permits that the, the product between the density and and the equation of state is a constant, obviously. So these are the changes that you have to, to make. Something very easy. Okay, yeah, thank you, it was clear. Well, well you're welcome. Uh, I want to stress one thing related to your question that, is, that was a, a very good question. Um, this model, my model, is, um, could be falsified. 
because it's one parameter model as well as the lambda CDM, so it can be falsified by observations. So if we are able to understand, first, the dark matter candidate, and second, if the question of state uh, seems to vary, uh, to, to vary a little bit during the universe evolution, then you immediately get some differences between um, the standard lambda CDM model and my model. And so you can disentangle somehow the two approaches uh, and falsify one of them, obviously. Thanks. Other questions? It's quite strange to me to to ask other questions to me, <laughs> to myself. <laughs> okay, if no more questions, we can go further with the, the presentations. Yuri, I think now it's your turn. Okay. Okay, you can share the screen, please. And you can start. You have 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, do you see my presentation? Perfectly. Okay, uh, good morning. I am Yuri Dumin from the Sternberg Astronomical Institute of Moscow State University. And I am going to present you the report entitled The Model of Dark Energy Based on the Quantum Mechanical Uncertainty Relation. Um, so it is commonly believed now that uh, the effective uh, cosmological constant is of crucial importance both in the early universe where it is responsible for the inflation and uh, in the modern universe where it is responsible uh, for the observed accelerated expansion. However, very little in, uh, is known now about uh, the physical nature and origin of uh, this quantity. Uh, moreover, its magnitudes in the early and modern universe are uh, absolutely different. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in the early inflationary models developed in the late 80s and 90s, uh, it was often assumed that uh, the effective lambda term uh, could be produced by the, by, the, by the condensate of the Higgs field, uh, which is an important constituent of the modern theory of elementary particles. Uh, but uh, the subsequent detailed calculations did not support this hypothesis. So in the um, contemporary cos cosmological models, uh, the lambda term uh, is usually derived uh, from the Lagrangians where uh, some additional terms uh, are added quite arbitrarily just by hand. A natural question arises, uh, if it is possible uh, to derive um, the effective lambda term uh, from some kind of uh, more general physical principle. And secondly, uh, if um, such um, uh, lambda term could be introduced so that uh, it will uh, substantially decay uh, in the course of time. Uh, the main aim of my report is to show that uh, this can be done uh, by employing just uh, the uh, quantum mechanical uncertainty relation between the time and energy. Uh, let me remind you that uh, the uncertainty relation was introduced in fact by Heisenberg uh, just during uh, development of quantum mechanics but uh, it was related, uh, related mostly to the problem of measurements. However, about uh, 15 uh, years later in the work of Mandelstam and Tom in 1945, um, uh, the uncertainty relation uh, between the time and energy uh, was uh, generalized uh, to the case of the long-term uh, evolution of quantum systems. The corresponding relation in fact has uh, almost the same uh, appearance as uh, in the Heisenberg uh, case. The only difference that uh, the coefficient C you are appearing here will be three times greater, but this is in fact not so important for us now. Unfortunately, this work by Mandelstam and Tam remained um, uh, un almost unknown for, for a very long time. And um, uh, only in the last decade, it attracted attention uh, 
um, of specialists in such a branch of quantum mechanics uh, as, for example, the quantum um, information processing and uh, similar areas. And they began to use uh, this relation for estimating the long-term energy evolution of quantum systems. And in fact, uh, the main idea of my work is to employ this uh, approach in cosmology. Uh, so uh, since uh, the lambda term is uh, immediately related to the energy density of vacuum, I consider uh, the vacuum energy in a Planck volume and uh, estimate it just from the Mandelstam time relation. As a result, I get uh, the effective lambda term, which is inversely uh, proportional to T, where T is uh, the total time of the cosmological evolution starting from the Big Bang. Next, if uh, this, really, uh, this expression for the effective lambda term is inserted into Friedman equation, we get the following master equation of our cosmological model. Of course, uh, it's quite unusual feature is uh, uh, the explicit dependence on time in the right hand side. Uh, uh, as far as I know, such situation was never considered before. How, however, as follows from our analysis, uh, this explicit dependence on time does not lead to any substantial physical problems. So uh, to get uh, the simplest solution, uh, let us assume that uh, the three-dimensional space is flat and uh, the ordinary matter density is ignored. Uh, then uh, the Friedman equation is trivially uh, integrated and uh, the independence of the scale factor on time will be given by this kind of the uh, quasi-exponential function. I call it quasi-exponential because this is not the exponent of time, but exponent of the square root of time. Uh, and the corresponding Hubble parameter evidently decays with time uh, inversely proportional to the square root of t. So what are the main properties of such a simplest cosmological model? Uh, first of all, uh, while in the standard cosmology, the evolution is composed of the four absolutely different states, namely uh, governed by the uh, lambda term, then uh, by radiation, non-relativistic matter, and again by the lambda term, as, show, uh, as shown here by the blue line. Uh, in our model, is, uh, the entire temporal evolution is described uh, by the same universal quasi-exponential function. So the puzzle of uh, the two very different lambda terms becomes naturally resolved. Um, unfortunately, uh, a, a very unexpected prediction of this model is that uh, the total age of the universe uh, should be much greater than in the standard cosmology, namely by this huge quantity, 10 to 61. However, it should be kept in mind that this difference is just due uh, to the very long tail of this function on the left-hand side, corresponding to the uh, very early universe. And uh, uh, it is not uh, immediately related to uh, observational constraints. Uh, and next, of course, um, it is um, interesting to answer the question, uh, if our model uh, resolves uh, the uh, other well-known problems of the early universe, such as the absence of singularity, uh, the causal connectivity between the remote spatial subregions, uh, and uh, the associated problems of homogeneity and isotropy of the observed space, and uh, the absence of topological defects, uh, and at last, uh, if it is uh, possible uh, to form the approximately uh, flat uh, three-dimensional space uh, in a self-consistent way, starting from arbitrary initial conditions. Uh, so the first problem, the problem of singularity, is uh, naturally absent uh, in our model where uh, the temporal dependence of scale factor is written by this function. Uh, moreover, this solution uh, in principle is favorable uh, for constructing uh, the bounce model of the universe when construction, uh, contraction uh, is followed by the expansion. But I'm not going to discuss this um, issue in more detail now. Uh, the next um, uh, important problem is of course, the problem of causal uh, connectivity between the remote spatial subregions. Um, as you probably know, uh, the crucial drawback of the old pre-inflationary uh, pre models governed by the ordinary matter 
was that the observed region of space shown in this conformal diagram by the upper blue triangle uh, involves a huge number of the subregions uh, developing independently, uh, starting from the Big Bang, uh, which are shown here by the uh, red triangles. Uh, so the number of such uh, disconnected subregion is given by this expression and turns out to be much greater than unity. Um, as a result of such situation, we should expect that the observed space will be very strongly irregular and uh, topological defects uh, should be formed at the boundaries between these domains. Uh, and um, the main advantage of uh, inflationary models is just the fact that um, in the case of inflation, the observed uh, region of space uh, shown here um, on the right hand side by the blue triangle is entirely inside the single uh, domain developing from the Big Bang, so that uh, the number of uh, disconnected domains uh, is formally much greater than uh, unity, and uh, there, will, uh, there will be no problem of irregularity, topological defects, and so on. Uh, what do we have uh, in the case of our model based on the uncertainty relation? Uh, in this case, the number of um, disconnected domains was calculated uh, to be given by this expression, which is substantially different from the expression in the standard inflationary models. However, uh, from the uh, qualitative point of view, the situation here is exactly the same as, uh, as uh, in, the in the standard inflationary scenarios, namely uh, the entire observed region of space shown by blue triangle is uh, entire, entirely within the same domain developing uh, from uh, the Big Bang. Therefore, the problems of uh, homogeneity and isotropy of the space, the absence of topological defects and so on, can be resolved as, the, uh, as efficiently as um, uh, in the well-known inflationary models. Uh, at last, um, one more uh, important problem of the early universe. Uh, is uh, the possibility of a self-consistent formation of the approximately flat uh, three-dimensional space in the course of time, uh, starting from the generic initial conditions. Um, as you know, uh, if we look at the Friedman equation uh, and consider the model uh, governed uh, uh, by the ordinary matter, then its density will decay with time inversely proportional to the um, scale factor in the third or first power. As a result, uh, this uh, first term will decay faster than the second term responsible for the curvature. Uh, so that the curvature uh, in general should increase in the course of time and uh, the approximately uh, flat space cannot be uh, formed by a self-consistent way. So we need uh, to assume a priori that the coefficient k uh, is equal to zero. On the other hand, the main advantage of inflationary models uh, if, uh, is that uh, if, we, uh, if we had uh, the third term where lambda is constant or slowly varying function, then evidently in the course of time, uh, the second term, the term of curvature, uh, will uh, uh, be negligible in the course of time as compared to the third uh, term. And uh, uh, the flat three-dimensional space uh, can be really formed. So what do we have uh, in our case of uh, the model based on the uncertainty relation? In this um, case, of course, lambda is not constant, but uh, substantially depends on time. Uh, but uh, we can easily find the limit of the third uh, to second term uh, when, uh, when time tends to infinity. Uh, it can be easily found that this limit is uh, infinite, that is, uh, uh, at large times, uh, the uh, second, uh, the, namely the curvature term, uh, will be negligible as compared to the uh, term associated with lambda. So again, as uh, in the standard inflation, uh, the uh, approximately flat three-dimensional space can be well formed. So uh, what uh, can I say in conclusion? Uh, firstly, uh, the uh, uncertainty-mediated cosmological model provides a unified description of the entire cosmological evolution uh, by the same uh, quasi-exponential function. 
and majorly explains the existence of uh, the decaying cosmological constant. Uh, secondly, uh, the well-known conceptual problems of the early universe, uh, such as the absence of singularity, uh, a causal connectivity of the remote spatial subregions, uh, dynamical formation of the approximately flat uh, three-dimensional space, etc., uh, can be resolved uh, in this model as efficiently as uh, uh, in the standard uh, inflationary models. Um, of course, um, a number of uh, fine issues, such as the processes of uh, leptogenesis and baryosynthesis, the spectrum of uh, primordial fluctuations and so on, um, are still to be uh, considered in more detail. Uh, these, these quantities uh, were not uh, calculated yet. Uh, and um, I hope that um, when this will be done, uh, it will be possible to derive a more definitive uh, conclusion on the viability of this model. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much for your nice talk. Any questions to Yuri? Uh, hello, yes, I have one question. Uh, Yuri, I think in your model, lambda goes as one over t. Now, in yes. most of the uh, models with uh, a varying lambda, I think it goes as one over t squared. So uh, what I wanted to ask is, uh, you mentioned the age problem that you have in your model. How do you solve this problem? Thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I suppose that uh, this problem in some sense uh, is uh, uh, how to say is uh, uh, quite formal because uh, uh, this huge age actually corresponds uh, to the um, to the quite slow expansion of the universe um, at uh, uh, the uh, early stages of evolution, uh, which is actually un unobservable. For example, by the way, if we consider the purely um, uh, exponential uh, the inflation with purely exponential exp uh, expansion, then formally exponential function uh, uh, goes to uh, how to say to minus infinity. And formally, in this case, you have uh, uh, in such idealized inflation, you have uh, infinite age of the universe. So it's uh, not uh, from my point of view a real problem because this uh, um, uh, uh, huge age. Uh, 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 corresponds to, to the process, uh, uh, to, to, to the very early stage. It's not actually from, uh, how to say, the hot Big Bang when the matter was created, but uh, from some kind of uh, uh, very early inflation. So, um, of course, there may be some problem here, but um, in the first approximation, I, I don't see uh, very much contradiction. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I would like to ask a quick question, very quickly. Uh, the reheating is somehow predicted by your framework or? Oh, no, of course, it's uh, reheating is a, it's a separate uh, pro uh, Some people already asked me about uh, the uh, reheating. Oh, <laughs> of course, it's, uh, sh should be con this, this process should be considered uh, in more detail. Uh, the calculations uh, which were presented in my report is the uh, simplest approximation somehow, the first approximation. So maybe this is uh, a, a, first, a first version of your model without reheating, then you have to expand, to extend the model, I mean. Of, of course, I, I actually, in this case, uh, I uh, in fact ignored uh, at all the ordinary matter, so there, there was no reheating. Re reheating, of course, uh, and creation of ordinary matter should, uh, should be uh, included, of course. Okay, thank you so much for your very nice talk. And we have now a coffee break, um, a, a self coffee break, unfortunately. <laughs> so you can take uh, whatever you desire, the coffees, whatever. Uh, we, we can see here um, at 11 o'clock, uh, Rome's time, if possible, from your side. I hope to see you again in so more or less 25, uh, four minutes. And we will uh, see very soon then. So, okay, enjoy your break. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you are able right now. Carlos, hi. 
Hi. Uh, in this second part, we have just two speakers. I told you at the very beginning, one of the three is no longer able, unfortunately. Uh, so the 84 will stop very soon after these two talks, unfortunately. <laughs> it's a pleasure for me to stay here with you. So now it's the turn of Carlos Martins. Carlos Martins. Um, so please, Carlos, you can share your screen. Yes. Right, thanks very much. Uh, so let me put it on full screen. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. So I'm Carlos Martins from the Center of Astrophysics of the University of Porto. Uh, and you can see my email on the slides in case you want to contact me afterwards. Um, so I want to report on some work uh, done by my team in Porto, mainly work done by undergraduate and master students, I, I should say. Uh, unfortunately, they're all currently having exams at this time of the year, so I, I get to uh, come and talk to you about what they're doing. So first, by, by way of motivation, uh, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, we all know that the acceleration of the universe is a puzzle. Uh, one can argue that it, it, it shows that uh, our current theories of cosmology and particle physics are at least incomplete or possibly incorrect. Um, so there should be some new physics out there that is waiting to be discovered. And therefore, the, the role of uh, astrophysical facilities is to try and search for, identify, and ultimately characterize these new physics. Uh, so what I'll tell you about is some of the work we do uh, in Porto towards this goal, uh, specifically focused on, on dark energy phenomenology, which is uh, uh, closer to the, to the spirit of this session. Um, so just for, for, the, for the sake of those of you who don't know what we do, um, so our team essentially uses the, the universe as a laboratory in which to do uh, fundamental physics tests, uh, and this includes uh, precision astrophysical spectroscopy, uh, but also includes other tools, uh, so we try to cover both theory, data analysis, and computer simulation. Uh, and we're also involved in various uh, experiments, including Euclid, for example, and several experiments of the European Southern Observatory. And our, our goal is to <clears throat> tackle some uh, questions such as what makes the universe accelerate, are the laws of physics universal, and, and so on. So we also uh, pay some attention to trade education and outreach, and that's, of course, off topic for uh, for this session, but I'm, I'm happy to tell you about it later on if, if you're interested. Okay, so, so what's the plan? Um, what I want to show you very briefly is a sort of comparative analysis of constraints you get from low redshift background data uh, on three models or three classes of models that are being proposed as, as alternatives to, to the acceleration of the universe. So these are the Generalized coupling model, scaling variant model, and steady, pay, steady state torsion model. I'll, I'll introduce each one of them in what follows. Uh, and just for the sake of comparison, I'll use the, um, the traditional Chevalier Polarski linear parameterization of dark energy as a benchmark, in, in the sense that I will describe in the next slide. Um, and we'll study, or we have studied, each, each of these models under two different assumptions. So the first one is to treat them as, say, genuine alternatives to lambda CDM, where you don't have a cosmological constant and therefore you expect or you try to see whether this new mechanism or degree of freedom can give you the low redshift acceleration uh, that we observe. The alternative is to treat them as parametric extensions to lambda CDM in the sense that you still have a cosmological constant or you still allow for one, but you have this additional mechanism, this additional degrees of degree of freedom. Um, and, and then you just, you just compare the model to data and let data tell you uh, which of the two mechanisms is dominant or what can be the, the relative contribution of, of each one of them. 
So, so that's our uh, general philosophy. If you want. Um, so for this comparison, we'll use, as I said, low redshift background data. Uh, we're focusing on the background first because it's simpler and second because um, studying perturbations in some of these models is a little bit tricky. So we just wanted to do a sort of preliminary comparison at, at background level to see how interesting the models are and then one can expand later on. Uh, so we're going to use the, um, the typical Pantheon supernova data set of Reese et al. And also a compilation of measurements of the Hubble parameter obtained by different methods. So some are from cosmic chronometers, some from variant acoustic oscillations and so on. Um, I will not discuss the, the Hubble constant, uh, but ju just for the record, um, in everything that, I, that we do and everything that I'll show you, a double constant is always marginalized. Um, so, so that's why you will not see it as an explicit parameter in the constraints that I'll show you. Okay, so, so with that said, let's, let's start with the CPL parameterization that you all know. Of course, uh, this model has been constrained many times by many people using many data sets. Uh, so our purpose here is just to see how constraining the data sets that we are using are for the specific model and use this then as a benchmark to compare <clears throat> to the constraints that we get for the other models. Uh, so, so what you have on the left is the constraints from these data sets that I mentioned uh, for a model with a constant equation of state, uh, so fixing WA to zero. Uh, so preferred value of omega matter is about 0 0.27. Uh, you have an equation of state close to minus one as, as expected. Um, if you extend the parameter space and do allow for a, a redshift dependence of dark energy, so allowing for WA, uh, the constraints on omega matter and W0 do not change too much. Uh, WA is not very well constrained. I, I don't have a specific plot in the slide, but, uh, but you, you get a relatively weak constraint because of various degeneracies. Also, the constraint you get on WA depends a little bit on, on the range of WA that, that you allow for, so essentially the prime. Okay, so this is our benchmark. So, so let's move on to the, uh, to the alternative models. So first um, is what is called steady state torsion. So you already heard earlier this morning that you can include torsion in your theory and still preserve a homogeneous and isotropic universe. Um, so these models have been proposed and studied for a long time. Um, there's been a recent interest in them and people like Kranas et al. and Barrow et al. Uh, have suggested them as a possible source of, of the acceleration of the universe. It's been decided uh, to look at them a little bit more and compare them to observations. Um, so, so just for a quick reference, the friedman rachel durian continuity equation in these models uh, look like this. So essentially, the assumption of homogeneity and isotropy mean that uh, you can describe the effects of torsion by a degree of freedom phi, which is essentially a kind of scalar field, uh, which is only dependent on time, but not on space at the background level. Um, and you can have just ordinary matter, or so we also consider the case of a barotropic fluid, a constant equation of state uh, that need not be zero. Um, and I won't make the distinction on, on, on priors here, but in the paper, we also studied the cases uh, without priors, just with the data that I mentioned, and also with, with Planck priors on, on the matter density. Okay, so that's the general model, but the specific one we studied that has also been considered by Kranos et al. is what's called the steady state torsion model. So this essentially relies on the assumption that you have a constant fractional contribution of torsion to the, uh, to the volume expansion. In mathematical terms, this is, is equivalent to saying that this degree of freedom phi is just some constant lambda uh, times double parameter. And that, of course, simplifies your, your equations a little bit. Okay, so when you compare this to data, uh, you find out that if you don't allow for a cosmological constant, so if you want torsion to be the only mechanism, uh, this model is completely ruled out just by this background data. You get a reduced chi-square that is always larger than 2.7, so even in the uh, best case scenario, so to speak. 
Um, however, if you treat it as a one parameter extension of lambda CDM, then you, you're still allowed a, a contribution of torsion, uh, which can be neatly characterized by this lambda parameter, which is a dimensionless parameter. Um, and this contribution is at, essentially at the percent level. Uh, so this is described in the paper, uh, which Katarina Marks is, is the first author. Uh, so on the left, you have constraints uh, just for, for normal matter, so with, with uh, pressure equals zero. And these are the constraints in the omega matter lambda plane. So you have the usual one, two, and three sigma confidence levels. Um, and the color map uh, denotes the reduced chi-square in each point of parameter space. And this is the convention that I'll use in, in all the plots in this slide and also in subsequent slides. So, so you get a, an easy visual comparison between models. So on the left, you have the case of W equals zero. On the right, we have the case where you allow, you allow for a, a non-zero equation of state. Uh, the constraints are more or less the same. They, uh, uh, the parameter space is enlarged, so, so the uh, constraints are a little bit weaker, but they, they don't change substantially. So you're still allowed a few percent uh, lambda, uh, and you allow an equation of state to deviate slightly from zero, but not by that much. There's also, I should note, independent constraints on the value of, of this equation of state of matter, uh, which you could impose as a prior, and, and that would uh, force you to be a little bit closer to this W equals zero. So in, in any case, the uh, take home message is you're, you're allowed a few percent uh, contribution from torsion from, from this background data. Okay, the second model is so-called generalized coupling model. So this is a model uh, proposed by Feng and Carloni, uh, which essentially assumes that the coupling between matter and the metric in your Einstein equations is not just uh, eight, 8 pi g, uh, but it's due to some fourth rank tensor with the constraint that uh, the coupling becomes trivial in vacuum. So you choose this such that in vacuum you still have general relativity, but in the presence of matter, uh, things become a little bit more complicated or more interesting, depending on your point of view. Um, so intuitively, you can think of these models as giving you two types of vacuum energy. So you still have the usual cosmological constant, uh, but matter fields themselves give you a second kind of vacuum energy. Uh, and you can also think of this as a bimetric theory. Uh, I think Carloni paper describes this in detail. Um, so the Friedman and Richard Rui equations look like this. So you know, they look a little bit messy, but uh, they do reduce to lambda CDM in the appropriate limit. So there's a, an additional parameter, which here is a small Q, uh, but it's actually, at least for the purposes of our analysis, simpler to define a second one, which you call uppercase Q, which is just little Q uh, times the critical density today. So in, in this case, uh, uppercase Q is, is again dimensionless. When you go through the analysis, you find more or less an analogous result to the previous model. Um, you still need the usual cosmological constant. If you set that to zero, then the matter density that you'd need would be almost 90% of the critical density, and, and this would be ruled out by other data. Uh, but you are, you're allowed the contribution of Q, again, at the percent level. Uh, and one interesting or peculiar feature of these models is that you actually have two branches of, of the solution. So you can see there's sort of fourth and fifth powers of the density in, this, in the Friedman and Rachel Dury equations. Um, and, and this corresponds to having positive Qs or negative Qs allowed. So, so statistically, there's, there's no significant deviation from zero, but you could have either a positive or a negative Q. And, and the physical interpretation of these would, would be slightly different. Again. In, the Frank and Carloni paper, this, this is described. Um, the plot that you see, again, assumes W equals zero, so normal matter. Um, again, if you relax this assumption, you get slightly weaker constraints, but qualitatively, the, the result is, is still the same. 
Finally, we have the scale invariance model. Um, so, so this is one example of what's called scale covariant theories that were popular in the 70s. Not that I remember it myself, but you can find lots of papers in the literature. So in particular, there's some interesting papers by Canuto et al. And these papers essentially assume that on large scales, space should be invariant. And again, this leads to a biometric theory. And if you assume homogeneity and isotropy, uh, you get a, another time-dependent function, which I'm, I'm also calling lambda. So please don't confuse it with lambda of the, uh, of the distortion model. And this lambda is essentially a transformation factor relating a scale invariant frame uh, to the matter frame. Uh, so again, Friedman, Rachel, Dury, and continuity equations look like this. Um, now, recently, Mather has studied a particular case of this model uh, where one imposes that the Minkowski metric should also be a solution of these equations. And this leads to some relations between parameters and effectively it eliminates the cosmological constant, so it's capital lambda, uh, from these equations. So it just simplifies it. And it also leads effectively to a time-dependent cosmological constant. So in this case, you can solve the continuity equation easily with this time dependence. And if you plug in W equals minus one, so usual equation of state for vacuum energy, you find that rho goes as T to the minus two. So, so this is effectively a theory with a time-dependent cosmological constant. Uh, so if you set, again, so go, going through the analysis pipeline, if you set W equals zero, so ordinary matter, you find that the best fit is a value of omega matter of 0 0.26, which is pretty much the same that you get in CPL. So it's a reasonable amount of matter. However, the reduced chi-square is much larger than the, than the CPL, CPL case. It's about 1.3, even if you allow for a non-flat universe, even if you allow for curvature. So this is clearly a, a poor fit. On the other hand, if you relax this equation and allow for a non-zero equation of state, uh, then the best fit is, is very, very different. We prefer about 6% of matter density, so relative critical density, and a very positive equation of state of matter, so W uh, around 0 0.6. So, so this, is, this would be a very peculiar and non-standard model. So, so this is just for the matter model. Uh, we're doing the analysis currently for, for, for the general Canuto et al. model. Uh, when I submitted the abstract, I, I sort of promised that we have results uh, in the talk. Unfortunately, we don't yet. Uh, we, we need uh, maybe a couple of more weeks to work on them, but they should be appearing soon. Uh, but, but I also should say that from preliminary results we have so far, they, they don't seem to be very different from the, uh, from the particular model of matter. Watch this space, things can still change. Okay, so, so, so let, let me conclude. Um, so, the steady state torsion and generalized couplings model have a, a very simple, uh, very similar behavior. Uh, the specific mechanism in each one of them is ruled out as a, as a single source of acceleration. Uh, but nevertheless, these mechanisms are still allowed uh, at, at the percent level as. as as contributions in a, in a sort of lambda CDM context. So they're not completely ruled out you know, by orders of magnitude. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also we only use background cosmology data. So if you include additional data sets, the constraints will of course be tighter. Um, scale invariance model is, is sort of interesting in a different way, I find. Um, so if you if you insist on having normal matter then the preferred value is nominally, nominally similar to, to CPL or, or to the usual standard cosmology, but, but you get a, a much poorer fit, at least if you quantify it by the reduced chi squared. If you extend the parameter space, then you get a very significantly different model, a very different amount of matter and a very different equation of state of, of that fluid. Um, so the conclusion seems to be that lambda CDM, at least at this, simple phenomenological model is actually quite robust. So it, even if it's a, only an approximation to a more fundamental model that we still don't know about, uh, at, at the phenomenological level, it seems to be doing pretty good. And, and with that, I, I stop and I'm 
I'm happy to uh, take any questions or, or discuss any anything that, that wasn't clear. Uh, hello, Carlos. Yes, I have one question. Uh, if you look at the scale invariance models, uh, you know, there were strong constraints placed on it by, for example, nucleosynthesis uh, some time ago. So yes. how do your constraints compare with those? And then one final point, you know, in, in, in the theory of Kanuto et al, you find that the cosmological parameter arises naturally as a variable type term. So that could also help, for example, in solving the cosmological constant problem. I'm not sure whether you looked at that at all or not. Right. So, so you, you, you're correct in, in saying that, that there are uh, BBM constraints on, on, on these models, yeah, which are, uh, so I don't remember the numbers from memory. I, I tend to remember, but I, I might be slightly wrong, uh, that the BBM constraints are comparable or, or maybe slightly stronger, but, but not by much, but by a factor of a few. Uh, but again, I have to look at the papers again to be sure. Um, so, so regarding the, the role of, of cosmological constant, uh, yeah, it's true that, that in, the, um, in the generic Canuto et al. model, um, you don't get this cancellation that you have in the Mayader model. So in the Mayader model, essentially you can replace capital lambda and just have little lambda. So you don't have capital lambda explicitly. This cancellation does not happen in the generic Canuto et al. model. Uh, so you still have it there. And yeah, in, in that sense, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, it's naturally there. Um, however, I think, and again, you know, the caveat is that our analysis codes are still running. So, so, so uh, this may, may change the, uh -huh. the, the full picture. Bon dia, Bruno. I, I think bon the, um, you will get a, a constraints that, that are more or less similar to, to the other cases. Uh, so you, you have the, um, you're allowed the usual lambda roughly at the typical level. And then you have this additional mechanism, uh, maybe at slightly more than a few percent as in the other cases, uh, because you have more parameters. So you're gonna get degeneracies between the parameters and, and so so maybe you have more freedom in the general case than in the, than in the case that I described. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I have also a question, if I can. Please. Yes, I, my question is about uh, torsion, so the first model you presented. And um, my question is, in that case, what is the, the physical origin of torsion uh, in that model? Because uh, as in the Einstein-Cartan theory, uh, it is related to spin, for example, and also spin fluid is proposed sometimes as a, as a model included in the Friedman equation. Then. So my question is, what is the physical origin of torsion in, uh, in that case? I mean, in principle, it's, it's the same because these models, uh, to the extent that I understand them, is a, let's say, a, a descendant of Einstein-Cartan type theories. It's just that you, you know, first you impose homogeneity in isotropy, and then you impose this uh, steady state uh, constraint, which is, I mean, I think it's, it's also fair to say that this is just a simplification that allows you to solve the equations more easily and compare them to data, right? So it's, I mean, it's, it's purely phenomenological. Uh, so I, I don't know if, if you can interpret this steady state assumption at a more, at a deeper level in, in terms of fundamental physics. Uh, I mean, for my purpose, it is just a, a simplification that gives you the relatively simple Einstein equations that, that you can solve and compare easily to data. Oh, okay, thank you. Any further questions to Carlos? Actually, I, I have two curiosities, if I don't bother you so much. Um, just, I would like just to know which program have you used for, uh, I think th these are Monte Carlo simulations, uh, the ones that you presented, the, the contours that you presented. Uh, 
Um, well, we have done MCMC analysis, uh, but, but the ones that, that, that I've plotted are all grid-based, essentially, because the parameter space is small enough that you can do it on the grid. Um, so you're, you wrote by yourself a code and you got some results, you mean? Yeah, or, yes. Uh, oh, so, okay. so uh, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, all these analyses were done by undergraduate and master students, and it's a good exercise for, for them to write their own analysis code, compare no it problem, to the literature, yeah. you know, validate the codes and so on. So yeah, yeah, that's so, fine, uh, that's fine. I and mean, the, you know, the, second, the second curiosity, just to know, uh, since you have tested more than one model, maybe you can consider AIC and BIC selection criteria, don't, don't you think? Uh, yeah, this, this is something that, that we're thinking about, yes, uh, you know, and, and do, to do a, a sort of general explanation, exploration of various models. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's certainly a, a good idea and, and it's in our, our plans. Yeah, maybe I will contact you. I'm very interested in this topic. <laughs> Please, yeah, feel free. Okay, my pleasure as well. Okay, thank you again for this thank terrific you. talk to Carlos. If no more questions, uh, let's pass the next speaker, the last one for this third day of uh, AT conference, um, Philippe, Philippe Sembrin. Uh, I'm right with yes. the pronunciation. Yeah, kind of, at least. Okay. Okay. So then I'll try to share my screen. Yeah, you can share your screen and start whenever you want. Yes. Thank you. So can you see my slides now? Perfectly. Great. Yeah, perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Philippe Sembrin, as the switch pronunciation is and I'm just about to start my PhD studies here at uh, Umeå University in Sweden. So today I'm going to talk about a recent project with which is somewhat related to the well mystery of the cosmic magnetic fields. So this project was at the center of my master's thesis in engineering physics and was performed with guidance from professor Michael Bradley also here at uh, Umeå University as this subject of cosmic perturbations is uh, very close to his recent research. So uh, with that said, let's begin. So if we look out into space, there are seemingly many unsolved mysteries that still elude us. And one of these mysteries is centered on the large scale cosmic magnetic fields, which seem to permeate our universe. So we encounter these fields almost everywhere we look in galaxies and in clusters of galaxies. But as of now, it doesn't seem like anyone exactly knows exactly where they came from, and the topic still seems to be very controversial. But a popular explanation is that these fields were created very early in the history of the universe before the formations of uh, galaxies. It is then suggested that these fields were amplified later on through various mechanisms, starting with the onset of galaxy formation. To be able to explain the kinds of fields that we see today, these magnetic seeds have to satisfy certain criteria. Uh, amongst other things, they have to be strong enough to begin with. However, uh, many of the proposed viable mechanisms for generating these kinds of seeds seem to give very weak field strengths. So therefore, this, uh, this story can seem a bit problematic. Yet all the hope is not lost. A, a potential solution to this problem would be if there existed some mechanism for amplifying the seeds after they have been created, but acting before this galactic amplifier kicks in. And it is here that this project can be somewhat seen to enter the picture. So previous works have actually suggested that there are in fact some mechanisms rooted in general relativity and classical electrodynamics that can give the kinds of amplifications that we need. These works have been mainly based on a perturbative approach, where one has usually made use of a zeroth order background that is of the standard model FLRW type. However, since these are spatially isotropic, one has often been faced with going to second order in the perturbations to be able to see interesting interactions between the magnetic fields and the gravitational variables. To avoid this, uh, problem, which complicates matters a bit, I have used a slightly different approach. So instead of using this standard model FLRW, I have made use of the more general class of locally rotationally symmetric spacetimes. 
So using these space times, which in general are anisotropic, I was able to see interesting interactions already to first order in the perturbations. So the key to this feat was the fact that we're able to have a non-zero magnetic field on a anisotropic LRS background, which is essentially impossible on an FLRW background without breaking the spatial isotropy. So to describe how I arrived at my results, the layout of the presentation will be as follows. So first I will just mention some basic preliminaries, and then I will describe how we break the problem down into smaller pieces using these covariant splits of space-time. Since the equations can be a bit difficult to work with, we will then simplify them step by step, starting with linearizing them, and then also performing a harmonic decomposition. To simplify this description of the cosmological plasma, I will also apply the magnetohydrodynamic limit at the end. Then, if we have time, I will show some uh, numerical results originating from the final set of equations. So, when describing the space time curvature and how this interacts with energy and momentum, we will of course use some basic relations from general relativity and uh, differential geometry. So most of our equations will actually come from the Ricci identities and the Bianchi identities. So in these equations, we use the common decomposition where we have the vial tensor C and the Ricci quantities to the right here in the Riemann tensor. To specify the interaction between the space-time curvature and energy momentum, we impose Einstein's field equations in this form where we have allowed for a cosmological constant here, uh, capital lambda, which is just a constant in our case. Uh, so we will apply these equations a bit implicitly by simply uh, replacing the Ricci quantities here in the Riemann tensor with uh, the energy momentum tensor and the cosmological constant as described by this relation. But um, these equations can be a bit too much to deal with, so therefore we will break the problem down using covariant splits of space-time. And since you definitely most likely have already seen these kinds of splits, I will go very quickly through them, just mention some basic concepts. So often when we deal with, with space-time dynamics in a cosmological context, well, the equipped space-times, or the studied space-times rather, are equipped with a preferred time-like direction, u which could be the forward velocity of the cosmological fluid. And in such cases, it is often suitable to decompose our quantities with respect to this direction. So for this general vector w, we want to write it as a part along u and a part orthogonal to u, where this orthogonal part is found by contracting with a projection tensor h, which projects onto the three-dimensional spaces. The energy momentum tensor takes on the common form in terms of an energy density mu and an isotropic pressure p. Here we also have the uh, q, which is the energy flow orthogonal to u, and an anisotropic pressure to the far right pi. As for the Riemann tensor, that is a bit too long to state in this picture, uh, but we should note Im some important variables which emerge when we perform the decomposition of this object namely the electric and magnetic parts of the vial tensor E and H. So here we have made use of the three-dimensional uh, Levesivita volume element epsilon. So now we have some new important variables in terms of projections of, well, for example, the Riemann tensor and the energy momentum tensor. But to see how they evolve in time and propagate through space, we have to look a bit closer at the derivatives. So for this purpose, we define a time derivative with a dot and a spatial derivative with this capital D. We can then write the covariant derivative of the U field in the following way, as we saw on Monday, I think. So here we have theta, which is the expansion rate, uh, omega, which is the vorticity, and sigma, the shear. Here we use these angular brackets to denote the projected symmetric and trace-free part of this object with respect to the projection tensor H. So now we have the composed space time into a time-like direction and three-dimensional spaces orthogonal to that direction. 
but we but if we in addition to u also have a preferred uh, spatial direction m for example we can in principle go one step further and also decompose the uh, three-dimensional spaces so in the locally rotationally symmetric case this n would be the direction around which the space times are uh, rotationally symmetric since this additional decomposition of the three quantities is essentially done with the same procedure as before. I will not go into the details here, but we should note some important variables which emerge when we consider the spatial derivatives. So for this purpose, we introduce a half derivative, which is essentially the spatial derivative along this n direction. And we also define a derivative that is fully projected onto the two sheets using the capital N projection tensor. We can then write the spatial derivative of the n field in this way, which is quite similar to the decomposition of the covariant derivative of u. So here we have the phi, which is some expansion of the two sheets. Xi describes a twist of these sheets, and zeta describes a form of distortion. So here we use curly brackets to denote the projected symmetric and trace-free part of this with respect to capital N. So on taking a step back, what have we actually done? Well, uh, we have decomposed these important quantity, quantities relative to both u and n. So now we actually have to get the equations for these uh, new projections or projected variables that we have defined. So as I mentioned, we get most of our equations from, from the Ricci identities for these preferred vector fields, and also from the Bianchi identities. But these are, in general, not enough to be able to get a closed system at the end in our formalism. So therefore, in this project, we, we chose to close the system by applying Maxwell's equations for some uh, electromagnetic fields and the following two equations for the uh, cosmological plasma. So here we, we describe the cosmological fluid as being made up of a set of charged fluid components, so a, a multi-component plasma. These equations should then hold for the i uh, fluid component, and then should hold for all of the components, of course. So here, in the energy momentum equation, we have this uh, term to the far right, capital J, which could include some interactions between the fluid components, such as collisions and so on. So these are uh, essentially all of the basic equations that we need to get the closed system at the end. We also have to apply some uh, some uh, constitutive relations, but I will, won't go into the details here. So we can say that these are all of the, that we need, but the problem is that these are a bit difficult to work with. So therefore we have to simplify them as much as possible, first by uh, treating them perturbatively. So in the perturbative approach, we first have to look at the zero fold solution, which we assume to be a locally rotationally symmetric space time. These kinds of spacetimes are in general divided into three classes, one, two, and three, depending on their properties. So we chose to look at this class two, as it includes many interesting models. And as for class one and class three, these are either of limited cosmological importance or have been studied extensively before. So we chose to, to neglect these. So therefore, to zeroth order, we assume that the spacetime was homogeneous, a hypersurface orthogonal, and belonged to this LRS class 2. Then, to be able to use the same kinds of harmonics of, for all of these studied spacetimes, we also had to assume that this expansion of the two sheets was equal to zero. With all of these assumptions, the only non-zero dynamical variables are the following ones. So here, this sigma, at the beginning is a part of the shear, this curly E comes from the electric part of the vial tensor, and this B to the far right is the magnetic field along the direction small n. So here we have allowed for a magnetic field on the background. Then if we want to add some perturbations into the mix, we first have to uh, consider a well-known subtlety when defining these perturbations. So when defining our perturbations, we would like to compare the value of some variable on the perturbed manifold M with the value of 
that variable at the corresponding point on the background, m0. Here we have a bit of a gauge problem, because this definition will in general depend on how we choose the mapping phi between the manifold. To avoid this problem, we have made use of a set of gauge invariant variables, uh, which are chosen to be the ones which are identically 0 and m0. Since these variables are guaranteed to be gauge invariant due to these, the famous Stuart Walker lemma. So, therefore, to first order, we get the following rather large set of quantities to work with, which contain uh, things that are naturally so on the background, such as this magnetic part of the vial tensor. But we have also introduced some gradient variables to represent uh, the perturbations in quantities which aren't necessarily zero on the background, so there's the expansion rate and, and so on. Then, on rewriting the equations from before in terms of these quantities and throwing away each term that is quadratic or of higher order, we get approximately 52 equations for our projected uh, variables. So these include evolution equations, which have these time dot derivatives, so-called propagation equations, which have these spatial hat derivatives. We get mixed evolution and propagation equations and some so-called constraints which do not have any hats or dots. But since these equations are still a bit difficult to deal with, we go one step further in the simplification procedure and perform a harmonic decomposition. So in this decomposition, we write our scalars in the following way in terms of the eigenfunctions p and q. So this p takes care of the spatial dependencies along the n direction, and q handles the dependencies on the two sheets. In the end, these coefficients will then only depend on the time uh, coordinate. These uh, k's are uh, dimensionless moving wave numbers. For vectors and tensors, the situation is a bit more difficult, but I won't go into the details here. Uh, but essentially, we have to define vector and tensor harmonics, and we get even and odd parts, where the odd parts are denoted with these uh, bars. On inserting these kinds of decompositions into the equations from before, they actually reduce the set of ODEs in time and some constraints for these harmonic coefficients. At this point, however, the system remains quite large, so therefore, as a last simpli simplification, we apply the so-called MHD limit. So in this limit, we want to describe the plasma as being a single conducting fluid rather than working with the individual components by themselves. So therefore, we rewrite the equations in terms of the average plasma velocity, Vf, and the total energy density, mu f. So here we have also show, chosen to neglect the plasma thermal pressure. So essentially, we assume that the plasma components um, are kind of like dust in the, their rest frames. So with all of these assumptions, the system can be reduced quite a lot by using the constraints and solving for some of the coefficients in terms of the other ones. So in the end, we're left with a so-called odd sector and an even sector, where the variables in the odd sector do not mix with those in the even sector. Since we have evolution equations for all of these variables, the system actually closes at this point and should, in principle, be solvable but uh, the equations are still very lengthy and therefore a bit difficult to work with analytically. However, if we, since they now are just ordinary differential equations in time, they are very straightforward to solve numerically, which we have done. So if we insert the final set of equations into a numerical solver, we can get results like this, which show the magnetic field perturbations for different wave numbers. So we have a different wave number on top and the, the bottom row. So here we have initially introduced a small perturbation in the magnetic part of the vial tensor, but have left all other perturbations to be zero initially. So here we see that even if the magnetic field perturbation is zero to begin with, it will in general become non-zero later on due to the interactions with the other variables, which is uh, quite interesting. So in the end, uh, we were able to see some interesting interactions between the magnetic field and the gravitational variables. 
However, as it is, these results do not uh, yet give a definite answer as to the mystery of the cosmic magnetic fields, but could perhaps help in the investigation. So, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Philip, for your nice talk. Any questions? Maybe I have a question. Is this approach useful also for a possible quantization of, of gravity or? Uh, I haven't really, really thought about that, but of course, quantum aspects comes into the picture, especially when considering the generation of these kinds of magnetic seeds. But I haven't, um, I haven't thought about the possibilities for quantization, but I, I could think of it a bit more. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, cool. So, if no more questions, I think this amazing day has finished. Thanks to you all for being part of the 84 uh, parallel session. So, the session will take place again on Friday, very early in the morning for European time, Italian time at least. Um, have a nice day, you all. Thank you very much. And see you on Friday, if you wish. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.